Hey, what's up guys? Travis here with Every Single Sunday. Today, we are gonna be talking about one of the most controversial parts you can buy for your motorcycle and why you definitely want one. Hey, what's up guys? Travis here with Every Single Sunday. Like I said, we're gonna be talking about one of the most controversial parts you can buy for your motorcycle. And I got a bunch of comments from when I installed this part on my bike to back that up. But joining me here is Mike from Taco Moto Co., uh, one of the masters of the KTM 500 platform. Uh, this is the guy I've gotten all my parts for for my 500 and has helped me get this thing into the beast it is. So Mike's gonna be explaining what we're working with here and uh, why you're gonna want one of these on your bike. So the part we're talking about today is Taco Mike's in-house product called the mother of all oil filters. That's the actual name, right? That's what we call it. I, there's some fans. Uh, my wife isn't super excited about that name, but for now, <laughs> that's what we call it. Mother versus mother, right? Yeah, uh, it is the ultimate oil filter. We, we chose that name. Okay, really quick guys, this is a 35 minute video and there's tons and tons of information. So if you wanna watch it, that's great, but I don't expect everyone to. Um, like I said, table of contents. You can jump to these minute marks here and we'll teach you about paper filters. We'll teach you about stainless filters and we'll teach you about Mike's uh, mother of all oil filters. And then if you want, jump to the minute mark for the final section, which is at the very end of the video where we actually go through and we look at the test results of my oil after 30 hours from Blackstone Laboratory. All right, guys, back to the video. Thank you. We chose that name intentionally because in our opinion and through our testing and through evaluation of others who have done the work, um, it's it's the it's the ultimate oil filter you can put on your bike. Gotcha. So with that being said, uh, what the product essentially does is it eliminates your paper filter and replaces it with some crazy magnets. Yeah, so you don't have a pleated mesh filter, whether it's paper or stainless steel, and it's now you have a magnetic rod that is your uh, attractant. So that is the, that's the surface, that's the material that's, that attracts the particles. Gotcha. And that's where we got all this controversy and hate and uneducated comments on my last install video of this product. It was on my Instagram, not here on YouTube. Um, and I'll drop some of those comments in for you. But all these people coming on here going, you're taking your paper filter out, you're gonna blow your bike up, I don't trust you on your opinion anymore, blah, 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 blah. I don't know anything about this stuff. I'm stupid. Mike's smart. I trust him on what I'm going to put on my bike. All right, Mike. So explain to me how this thing works. Because in my head, paper filters necessary. It's what the oil goes through. It filters it. Why does your mother of all oil filter kits work better or equivalent? Is it better? Is it? What? Tell me about this thing. Yeah. So let's take a couple of steps back and talk about traditional uh, uh pleated media filter. So that could be either paper or stainless. Okay. So, so OEM's the paper one. Yeah. And is it Canon that sells a metal one or other companies do? So, uh, so Scott's has a metal one, a stainless steel pleated. Also PC Racing has a has a stainless steel one. Okay. Your, um, whatever filtration device you choose, it's a lot like tires, tubes, mousse, tire balls. Any time you make a decision or you go with the product, you gain a package of advantages and then you leave something on the table. And so you're always looking to, basically as you make a choice of a component, you're just moving the dial. Do you want more of this, less of that? Like what are those performance thresholds? What are the things that you need out of a component? And so the reason, well, okay, so before we kind of go down that road, <laughs> let's talk about the two more commonly known or traditional filters and that would be a paper mesh filter or a paper pleated filter. I'm, I'm going to drop one in the video Through right the Magic here. of Hollywood. Ta-da! So a standard paper filter which comes stock on your bike and is what most guys are buying. There are guys who will upgrade to a stainless steel pleated filter. Uh -huh. And so let's just focus on those really quick. Stainless steel. Those are made by Scott's <laughs> and PC. So paper is going to come on your bike and that's your, the traditional filter. They are low cost. So what are some of the advantages? Low cost, uh, proven reliability, uh, trust factor is very high. They uh, do a, uh, a good job of filtration and how they work is think of, a, think of that paper filter as like fiberglass. So if you make fiberglass, you basically have a bunch of little fibers, links of fibers, and you're in, in, the, in fiberglass, you're overlaying those fibers or you might have a 
this and this and this and this. Yep, it's a mesh. Um, you might have blown fiberglass, which kind of shoots them out of a gun, a pressurized gun. But the concept is you have these strands of the absorbent paper material. And those are, so uh, to make paper, you just sort of lay those on top of each other. And then that's a flat plane, that's the flat surface. And I think of it, in my mind, uh, good visualization is like a bush. So you have a bush where you have some branches that will cross very tightly, branches and leaves. You may not even be able to see any sunlight through there. Very tight little, little uh, uh, gaps. And then you'll have areas where you'll have large gaps. Another way to visualize this is like Swiss cheese where you have some large holes and small holes and it's just a co-mingling of these various sizes of holes. Okay. So as the oil is flowing through it, the smaller holes or smaller crossings of those fibrous materials are gonna catch and trap the smaller particles, mm -hmm. but you're gonna have some big random ones and you'll have those particles that may pass through those bigger ones. And so through the just the law of averages, the oil is gonna <clears> recycle <throat> itself and eventually the concept or the hope would be that eventually those little baby particles are gonna find a matching baby hole, they'll get trapped and suspended. And you hope that it would be, it, perfection would be that every pass you're capturing one of those particles in the correct size hole. Okay. Uh, a stainless, can we talk, talk about that really quick? Mm -hmm. So a stainless is where there are actual holes in the material and they're of a pre-calibrated size. Mm -hmm. The manufacturers will specify what their different hole diameters are, but those are typically 30 micron. Okay. So as long as you have uh, suspended particles that are 30 plus, they're trapped every time. If you have anything smaller, they will pass through and then how those smaller ones will get trapped is you'll have a larger piece or a weird shaped piece that will be trapped in one of the holes and it will sort of form, there'll be little small gaps that those little guys will then bunch up and pack oh, okay. themselves and into. The excess spot around the particle that got stuck essentially. That's it's right. A smaller hole. Yes. Okay. So basically, if you were to take one of the paper filters, cut it off, stretch it out into a sheet, if you held it up to a bright light, can you see dots of light in some spots. I've never actually yeah. done that. I've looked for material in them before, but you can see the different size pores in them essentially. Well, no, because it's a it's a it's a there's a there's a there's a stacked layer of those okay. of those fiber rows. And so I don't think you're going to see any sunlight, but if you put one, you could you could do this if you had just a standard schoolhouse magnifying glass. I'm a scientist. Okay, so I like, have all that stuff. I like have a whole a, laboratory. Beautiful. So <laughs> you go to your local school, steal the microscope, is what it is, and you get a he bright light. He told you to steal it from your local steal school. It, not steal me. it from your high school. And if you put a bright light on it, you will look at that and you get oh. it focused. You will see exactly what I'm talking about. Okay. This this layered, uh, these fibers <clears throat> just layered and stacked on top of each other. And the fibers, the, the oil and the, the oil is just worming its way through all of that media, that stacked media. Now, what we're looking for in there, basically, as your engine's running, little metal, metal particles are coming off of stuff, little fibers are coming off your clutch wear, and that's the stuff that's actually getting caught up in the filter, correct? Yeah. Okay. Now, let's switch over to your filter, filter number three. Okay, right ta-da. Um, as you can see, <laughs> there's no filter on it. There's, there's no mesh. There's a rod. Right. What the hell, how does this work? Okay. So uh, basically inside of that core, if you take a, so if you have one, if you own one or, or if you ever see us out at a, at a event or a ride event, we'll have some of these, but it's a, it's a rod and then inside of it, it's a hollow stainless steel tube and inside of that are rare earth magnets that are little disks and the north, so on a magnet you have the north and the south and so that's just the field of energy. You can go down the rabbit hole of studying magnetism and the north and south ends of the magnet and so, the way the field of energy works, the north is the strongest part. And so the, the norths of two magnets are pressed into each other. Well, those are in a constant state of repel. So that entire sleeve of magnets is trying to explode itself. If you cut into that, the whole thing would like a spring, like it's spring loaded with reverse energy magnetism okay. trying to push itself apart. So there's multiple magnets in that rod. It's not just one magnet. It's not one magnet, okay. it's multiple. So when I've done my oil changes, I notice there's lines of material down the rod. Stacked so. at, those, at those high <clears throat> energy points. So gotcha. where the magnetism is the strongest, that's where you'll have a band of debris across the thing. All right, makes sense all of a sudden. Yes. Now, 
the one of the things that everybody said on my Instagram video is, what about clutch fibers? Those aren't, what's the word you use? They're non-ferrous. Non-ferrous. That means yeah. non-metallic for well, my small brain? Yeah, so anything that is non-iron ore. So I, uh, there are different types of materials that are ferrous. Uh -huh. Typically, iron would be the most commonly associated one. Okay. And so a magnet will attract itself. So a magnet won't attract to aluminum or plastic or wood. Uh, the the material needs to be of a ferrous nature, okay. and then the magnet will attract to that. And so any ferrous material that's in the engine, um, you have you have quite a bit of that, and so that material is what's going to gather itself around the magnetism. The magnet's going to attract okay. that stuff. Initially, now, it's gonna what about a... the non-ferrous magnets or non-ferrous non -ferrous material. materials? Yeah. So inside so. of the engine, you have aluminum. You have fibrous material from the clutch plates. You have bronze from bushings. There's there's quite a few uh, wear materials. You have nylon from your plastic oil pump gears. Um, so there are quite a few materials inside of there, non-ferrous. They're non-magnetic. So how does that work? So once a once a surface layer, like a boundary layer of the uh, ferrous material, gets deposited on top of the, the magnetic core itself, then there are little micro ridges. So those particles are all you know, if you look at any of these under a microscope, they're all like, have you ever looked at pollen? Uh, you've seen mm -hmm. pollen under a microscope? All the time on Thursdays. Okay. So think of, <laughs> think of pollen under a microscope. It's just got irregular surface shapes. Yeah. Well, that's these little broken off and worn off pieces inside the engine. They're not perfectly round spheres. They're rough. And so those rough materials, they get, they get deposited on the magnet. And so it's just like mountains. And as the oil flows across that, think of that as air flowing across the mountains. There's these little turbulence zones and that creates static electricity. So it's a static charge. So the magnet operates on um, static adhesion. So there is, there is magnetic adhesion and static adhesion. Okay. And so um, let, me, let me say right here, to really deep dive this tech and how this all works, the magnet itself is made by a company in Canada called One Eye Industries. On our website, we link all of their science and all of the details and data about this. And your website is? Uh, Takomoto.co and One Eye Industries, and I'm sure Travis will put yep. the links to all that in there. So Extra plug. Yeah. So the exact science of how that works, it's a deep dive and you're, you should all study that and look at that. But I'm giving you sort of a, uh, a really, um, I guess the layman's version of this. And that is, is again, so you, 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 you deposit a ferrous layer, and then as the oil is going across that, then there is a static charge that builds up around that. That static charge is what then attracts and adheres the non-ferrous material. Okay. And the proof that this is happening is the, the data of the, the goo is collected. And so we've been doing this, and also the One Eye Industry Company, they've done this for years. This, none of this is new. Here's what's kind of blowing people's minds is if we, if, if people who are familiar with heavy equipment operation, mining, um, these are used in helicopter service, aviation. So there's a lot of industries that use this exact product, the one eye filtration product. Mm -hmm. It's used and it's known. This isn't sort of a new thing that's just popped up. It's been around forever. It's what's just new to the motorcycle. What's industry. new is small gasoline engines. That's okay. what's new. And Andrew Kramer out of Canada, AKT Tech, AKT, mm -hmm. um, he is where we discovered this. And then we've partnered with him and we're making these uh, with his design. And we, we do the machining on the, the cover and the stuff you see on the outside of the bike. Yeah. The rod itself is the one eye product. And Andrew put all this together. He's sort of the genius behind incorporating the one eye magnetic rod on moto use. Okay. And so here in the US, we're, um, we, we brought it to market and then we're, we're making the outer components. So again, none of this is new. Nobody should, this is not, this is not a new thing. It's uh, <laughs> 30 or 40 years this stuff's been put in industrial use. Right. Again, the novelty is, oh, I've never heard of it. Well, because not all of us are like heavy equipment, mechanics and engineers. And it is kind of out of left field. It is a, an interesting concept and a new thing in our world, but it's not a new thing. Right. Okay, so we have three types of filters. We have the OEM paper style, we have the stainless mesh, and we have the magnetic type. So 
what is the benefit of the magnetic type? Because when I initially saw this, I was a little bit of a sticker shock. And after talking with you, I decided, okay, I like the technology. I think it's gonna be good, but explain to those people what you explained to me that convinced me to pick one up for my bike. Yeah, so it's not the cheapest filter out there. It's probably the single most expensive filter, oil filter that is available for these bikes. Um, especially when you consider you can buy like on Amazon or eBay for two or three bucks, you can get a paper filter with fitment for these right. bikes. Uh, so the, let's talk about, let's kind of work through uh, disadvantages of each paper or each material. So paper, what are some of the disadvantages of that? One is they are absorbent of water and that is both an advantage and a disadvantage. So uh, a water molecule will find and adhere itself in a collection of water molecules which have attractive energy. They will attach themselves to the, the absorbency of the paper filter. Okay. And so you can replace the ability for a paper filter to flow oil through it because it's attracted and it's holding water. Okay. So if you're ever in a situation where you're doing a lot of short riding and you're creating moisture, so one of the byproducts of the internal combustion process, the chemical process, is uh, water, H2O. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have you're gonna have moisture and water forming in your in your crankcase. Okay. That either is burned off through heat because you're you're high temperature cycling the engine, or it's gonna be attracted to the paper filter. And uh, also, if you get water in your engine because you've swamped your bike or you've done anything, you've done some water crossings, we've all have done it, and you get some water in your oil, that will supersaturate the filter. And then now your filter is no longer flowing oil. The oil has to continue to cycle through the engine, and that oil is going to trip the bypass spring and ball, and you will just have your oil flow around the filter and to where it needs to go, but it's no longer filtered. Gotcha. You have an experience where you had a super clogged filter. Oh yeah, I was working on a friend's bike, not gonna say who. Actually, I was working on two of his bikes that had not had much service done, and the OEM paper filters were collapsed completely from vacuum in the system, push them shut. Next time you guys do an oil change, try and compress one of those filters down to nothing. It's impossible. But I'll drop the pictures in here, so what happened with those is once they compressed, the bypass opened and these bikes ran without any oil filtration at all. So while it doesn't happen very often, it definitely can happen. It can happen and we so. both have seen it. I've, I've seen it before yours and you had it happen yeah. personally. So a filter, a paper filter can be saturated with water, a paper filter can be saturated with debris, it can collapse, it can go to bypass. A paper filter also, if you are doing cold startups, um, you have and you're running a little bit too thick of oil that paper filter may not be able to flow oil through itself, or at least enough, and the engine protects itself with the bypass. Okay. So you're running unfiltered oil until the oil gets up to temp and becomes viscous enough to mm -hmm. work its way through the mesh gotcha. material. Um, stainless filters. So stainless filters, they uh, do not mm. they do not saturate with water. So the advantage of a stainless filter, if you're running like overland use, you're running kind of uh, a situation where like a DNF is not an option right. and you might be swamping your bike on a long BDR type experience and you might be getting some water and you might have to then run 10 miles or 20 miles to town so you can swap your oil out mm -hmm. then a stainless filter is kind of the go-to choice for those type guys because you can flow water and oil through those they have bigger pores so they offer less resistance to the oil and you do pick up horsepower with now this is a very small amount we're talking maybe half a horsepower one at the at the most but the thinner your oil is you will pick up horsepower or the the least the the so if you can remove resistance pumping losses and resistance mm -hmm. from your engine then you will gain power okay so a stainless steel filter is often used in race bikes race applications where you do want some filtering you want better oil flow than a paper filter Mm -hmm. and you do want filtering and uh, you do need some of that backcountry reliability and you uh, stainless is cleanable you have to ultrasonic clean them and then back pressure through them and so it's a theoretically it's like a lifetime filter okay so there are plenty of people who in very intentionally pick a stainless steel filter because of those attributes it lends itself to their use more than a paper filter does gotcha and then moving into option number three your magnetic filter what are the benefits and everything of that filter. Okay, so the mother of all oil filters, 
What its advantages are, because there is no restriction to oil flow, so we don't have any, there's, there's no, the oil is not trying to force itself through any orifices. So you have full availability of all pressure under no impediment, no resistance through the system. So you pick up power, again, don't buy this filter because you think it's gonna, Small bit. it's tiny. Like don't think, oh, that's a high performance part. Um, it does give you a little bit more power, about a half a horse, maybe one, but it's there. So that's part of the data metric. The uh, other advantages of the filter are there's no resistance on cold startup. Okay. So your oil, whatever thickness you run, you don't have like valve clatter. Um, sometimes you'll have a car, especially with hydraulic valve lifters. We don't have hydraulic valve lifters. We have mechanical valve lifters. Mm -hmm. But if you've ever started a car in very cold temperatures that has the oil is too thick, oh, those yeah. lifters are, are in a Classic. collapse state. And before they can pressurize up, because that oil needs to fill those, oil is trying to work itself through the filter, through the system to, to pressurize those, mm -hmm. it'll clack. So that that sound is a direct indication that you are running, the, the pressure is low, insufficient mm -hmm. for a time. So, so if we won't hear the clacking on here, but you hear it, clacking. Could, it could be a low pressure situation where it's not lubricating. Properly. Yes, yes. Okay. So the same thing holds true where we're trying to get oil to the valve train up on the top cylinder head, which is very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. And if your oil is thick, it's got to push through the filter. It's got to push through those tiny orifices. So if you remove, let's at least remove the filter. Mm -hmm. And so you, you eliminate any of that. So cold startups are, uh, oil starvation on cold startups is, is potentially a thing of the past. Okay. Not a big data point in the decision, but it's there. Mm -hmm. Additional horsepower, it's not a big thing, but it's there. Uh, some of the real big reasons are you can run that filter when you have uh, moisture issues. So if you know, and that's what that's primarily why I went down the rabbit hole of looking at that filter in the first place, is because we do a lot of overlanding, Baja riding, Idaho riding, and we swamp bikes. Yeah, we swamp bikes, and there are times where we'll have oil, uh, we'll have water contamination in the oil, and we'll have to do some some riding. We might put ten or twenty miles on it, and. And I don't want to saturate out an oil filter, a paper filter, and go to bypass. Uh, the disadvantages of stainless are enough for me to not use them because they're not trapping microparticles. So what? So one of the other advantages with the the mother filter is the fact that the the static adhesion we're trapping particles in the four to six micron range. So the size of the particle matters you have gritty particles that are uh, like talcum powder. You know that Baja talcum dust? Oh yeah, that, that silt. That silt, okay, so that, and that's basically like lapping compound. So valve lapping compound, mm -hmm. toothpaste. So that, those particles are down in that range and that stuff is incredibly damaging. And so the objective was to trap particles in that four to six micron range. When you go below that, then there's, that's good because you're pulling anything and everything out of the oil that's, a, that's an aggregate, that's aggressive, that's a grit, mm -hmm. but that's abrasive, but the, uh, the additive package in the oil itself, so the oil has minerals, zinc, and other additives that are there, metallic compounds that are there intentionally f as a benefit to the oil. Mm -hmm. When we start going really small, we start grabbing those. Okay. So you have to, you have to kind of decide like at what point do we, is it safe enough to not grab oil additive pack uh, components, package components, but then we get into the bigger sizes and we want to grab those out. So we want to grab clutch materials. We want to grab sooty compounds. So those are like carbon, mm -hmm. carbon out of the fuel. So the blow by, so uh, <coughs> the, the, the rings have blow by those sooty, components, you know, when we change the oil in our Sprinter diesel vans, how black that oil gets, oh, yeah. those are carbon byproducts that get trapped and suspended in the oil. Well, we want to pull those out of the oil. We want those gone. We ideally, we just want pure oil, no, uh, no contaminants. And so that four to six micron range is the goal. Mm -hmm. And that is calibrated based on the size, the, uh, not the size, but the strength of those magnets. So the the energy of the, 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 the strength of those magnets is what really determines how big the particle attraction gotcha. is. So four to six is the goal. And uh, the oil analysis, the sludge analysis shows that 
you know, we're grabbing in that range. So it's doing what it's supposed to do. And the, the benefits, so there are those benefits um, that I just described and, and you're, grabbing, you're grabbing components reliably out of the oil that you don't reliably get with stainless or paper. Okay. And maybe the last thing is it's a life, basically it's a lifetime filter. When you clean, when you change your oil and you clean your filter, you just wipe the thing off and you throw it back in. But one of the things I've been experimenting with is to allow that sludge to stay on there mm -hmm. because the larger the surface area is of that sludge, it's not a ball, but like the, 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 rings the layer, yeah, yeah the, la the layer that builds up across there, you just have more surface area for more debris attraction. Okay, so leave the stuff on there? I don't know. You've, I'm, you've done oil testing, right? Yeah, and so I'm kind of extending, I'm experimenting where like I'm trying to determine how much is too much and what's the right amount. Oh, I will touch on something that was thrown up in a post. Somebody said, well, would there be the danger that hydraulic wash, like oil washing across that would, mm -hmm. would pick up that material and pull it away? And there is. The thicker that, that layer gets, the, the farther out you are, the less the, less the magnetism, the, mm -hmm. the adhesion you're, you're getting of that, that static boundary layer. Yep. So I'm trying to figure out, and I probably need to do a little bit of uh, research with one eye to find out if there is uh, uh, too much. Okay. You let it go too long. So, you know, I think the safe thing and probably what they would recommend is just clean it every time. Okay. That's probably what they would say. Um, so benefits of this system, it's reusable. It doesn't attract water. So if you're riding in water, it's not going to get saturated and fall apart. The stuff's going to last forever. That might've been the first one I said, I don't remember already. And yeah, just better filtration overall. It pulls more particles out than the paper or the aluminum one. Yes. And, uh, the last thing I would say about, about the filter is I have experienced this and other people too. So I like to run modal 7100 oil. That's a group five ester based oil. Mm -hmm. um, Maxima also has a very, very good oil. That is, is that the pro four or a uh, pro plus? Sorry. Yeah. I think that's what they call it. And so you're really looking for like soup. These are super premium oils. Okay. And I'm a Maxima guy myself. I use the pro plus 1050. It's been fantastic. I would say that they're just at that same level. This is the ultimate level of, of engine oil lubrication. The uh, the modal is red. And so what surprised me the very first time uh, after running about, about 20 hours on it, and now I'm running 60 hours. So on my bike, my 350, we're mm -hmm. running Baja, high demand, high, you know, high, high use oil cycles, not racing. This is like dual sporting. Yeah. Um, and I'm running 60 hour oil change intervals and the oil is, is good. And what's surprising is how, how I don't want to say clean because 60 hours, 60 hours on oil, that oil has been beat up, mm -hmm. but it, there is still red color in the oil and you can put it on a piece of paper and it is not black. It is not, it is not scorched. It does not look terrible for mm -hmm. that, that long of, of service life. And, um, I was monitoring my engine oil with a paper filter and after about 10 oils or 10 oils 10 hours the red in that oil almost was gone really? but now i'm at 60 hours with our filter and the red is still there so uh, i'm looking at 10 hour just color 10 hours versus about 60 hours and, good, and we can see so that just is demonstrating that the carbon is being pulled out and it's going on that filter and the the sludge reports show that nice um, and also guys, uh, Mike has been sending oil samples out to get tested. He's working with two or three different tour companies. Yes, so we have- so we don't need to name them or whatever, that's okay. fine. Um, but he's working with different tour companies that are putting tons and tons of hours on these bikes, collecting oil samples from those guys using his kit, sending them off to get tested and making sure everything is working good. So is that information on your website? Uh, we're gonna be building sort of a database of all of those test reports so the okay. guys can see that. And if you have oil that you, if you have one of these filters and you want us to test your oil, send us an email and I'll send you a free kit, a free oil. We'll do, we'll do oil sampling for you, we'll pay for it. We'll sample your oil and then add your data to the to the report that we're going to be compiling. To an extent, if a thousand people email him, or I'm going to say he's not going to do that. He doesn't even have to say it. So, um, yeah, I mean, besides that, it's all pretty straightforward. I'm stoked with the setup. I've been happy with my my 500 here, my KTM Gas Gas 500. And yeah, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, if you have any questions, go to our website because all that data is there. One Eye Industries is really, if you want to deep dive this and go down the rabbit hole, uh, they have all that information at a much higher level. Cool. And once again, guys, Mike from Takamoto Co. 
check him out for all your KTM 500, 350, four stroke needs. This guy sells it all and has an awesome location here in Las Vegas where they stock pretty much everything. Tons and tons and tons of parts that he makes, my tail light kits, these low profile blinkers, just so many neat little pieces, tuning, anything 500 related, Taco Moto Co. Yeah, thanks Travis. Cool, thank you so much man. Thanks dude. All right, guys, so let's check it out. This is my results from Blackstone Laboratories, the company that Taco Mike sent uh, this in to be checked with. All right, so let's dive into this. Uh, this is the top of the paper here. I just zoomed in so you guys can read it a little bit better. So unit ID, top right, Travis Brock, that's me, every single Sunday. Yep. Payment, credit card, Mike pays with a visa, apparently. And the date it was sent in, January 13th. Uh, more important, let's look at the unit here. So KTM 500, it's a 22 EXCF oil type, Maxima Pro Plus 1050. That's what I run on my bike. And oil use interval, 30 hours. That's uh, how long I ran this oil for. Um, I think it says the life of the bike somewhere on here also because I'm around 120 hours now with this. Anyway, uh, comments. Mike, filter sludge submitted separately. That's correct. We did send it. Nothing unusual about this oil sample's physical condition. Viscosity is proper for 1050. High flash point shows no measurable fuel dilution and insolubles are low. I think that's a good thing. TBN of 4.4 shows plenty of additive for longer oil use too. This high silicone can be a sealer, lube, or abrasive dirt. Thought we'd lean towards sealer lube since this engine is still young. Like I said, it's around 120 hours. Wear materials compare well to universal averages, which are based on the 25 hour to 50 hour run. Or sorry, that says close to 25 hours. And it says a 50 hour run looks doable next time. So basically the guys that inspected my oil here said you ran it for 30 hours. It looks fantastic. Try 50 next time. So that's pretty wild to hear. But when you get the laboratories telling you what it is, you can't really go wrong and you can't argue with that. All right, so let's zoom in on the little stuff at the bottom here, and I'll do my best to pick this apart for you. All right, so starting in the top left, motor hours on oil, 30. Motor hours on unit, 130. Like I said, that's the oil life on the bike, or sorry, hour life on the bike. Uh, sample date, makeup oil. That means did we add any oil in during this? No, I didn't burn any, so none was added in. And then we start looking at all the unit averages, so... Going down this, everything looks like it's pretty much in line with where it's supposed to be. Um, I'm stupid. Mike could probably tell you a little bit more about this, but he's not sitting here with me. Um, all I can really do is go off the last section I read where the oil company or the laboratory, sorry, tells me exactly what this stuff means. Because for me, their numbers, I have something to compare them to, that universal averages chart on the right-hand side. And beyond that, Everything looks fine. I, I really don't know. I trust this science. I trust what Mike told me. I trust what the laboratory is telling me here. And I think it's a good product. Um, overall thoughts? Yeah, it's expensive. It's not for everybody. But if you're going to be going down and doing Baja, to do a rip from uh, Tecate to Cabo puts about 50 or 55 hours on the bike. And for me, this makes me feel safer that I can do that. I, maybe I'll do one change at Bay of LA just to be safe or that's an oil filter change, or sorry, an oil change at Bay of LA halfway through. But knowing that if I don't do it, I should be just fine. So I think this is a damn cool product. And like I said, it's not for everyone. It's kind of expensive, but it's a cool, cool piece to have on the bike, especially if you're longer intervals. So anyway, check it out, takamotoco.com. Thanks again to Mike. Thanks again to everybody for watching these videos and listening to me to ramble for 35 minutes here. And uh, I hope you got something out of this. Take it easy and... Uh, Click the subscribe and like button, all that fun stuff if you want to. Thanks so much. Get out and ride.